everybody. Um, welcome to Training Without Conflict, episode number nine. This time we have Simone Gabois. It's pretty lengthy introduction, and I, I am almost afraid to even go and make the introduction, but uh, um, I, I, will, I will give it a try. Like the, the, the main things that I impressed me and that I really, really wanted to talk to you about is what 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 your interests are uh your background obviously the phds the teaching at the university and and what you're teaching is exactly what is of, of huge interest to myself and the people that i i do the podcast for so um like i know like when i pull from various internet places you know um like your research topics, obviously animal behavior, animal learning, olfactory processing in animals, neuro, neuroetology of action sequences, which I'm gonna need some explanation on. But you, you also teach like currently, which is super impressive to me, like animal behavior, advanced animal behavior, uh, topics in behavioral biology, comparative, animal psychology learning and motivation which is really really want to talk to you about again like this is one of i think most interesting podcasts that i'm having simply because we have um a great deal of similar interest like i i would say we're quite intense in in the areas that we are interested in in specifically dogs and then animal and learning and behavior obviously you're coming with a, a amazing background uh, a scientific background mine as far as science goes is all home study i never stop doing this but i have a about let's say 40 maybe more than 40 years of hands-on training of, of all sorts of uh, training dogs so great interest in that um please i i know you i j just for the for the audience like introduce yourself give a little bit more about your your background because i know i jump all over the place as i said in the beginning um i know this is like uh, i've been waiting for somebody to talk to about so many topics and i'm so glad that uh you accepted the offer and and we can have a cool conversation so tell tell us uh, just in in brief a little bit about your you how how everything started and and what you really care about with so i guess i guess what makes my my approach uh uh maybe a little bit different from others. Uh, and I, I say this, and I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but I, I'm really um, from different backgrounds in the sense that I started with biology, moved towards psychology, went back to something somewhere in the middle with neuroscience. And all across my career, from my bachelor degree to my master's to my PhD and and uh, 20 so years after that, I've been kind of integrating all three, psychology, ethology, and neuroscience. And I strongly believe that uh, to really understand behavior, and that's my bias, I have to admit, um, all these perspectives are important. Uh, because they're not competing with each other, they, they actually complete each other. And I find that a little bit uh, unfortunate that I think a lot of people in the dog world see uh, ethology as the opposite of psychology or, you know, the, the, the good old nature and nurture debate kind of thing, which you know, in science now, we don't even think is a debate at all, actually. it's. But it was a quite fierce debate at, at some point back in time, correct? Yeah. Be before, I would say before the 70s, that was, you know, the the big war between ethology and psychology was about nature and nurture. But then both, group, both groups kind of realized they were both wrong and both right about some stuff, right? And... It's really Robert Hind 
and and honestly, I have to say here, uh, for full disclosure, uh, he's part of my academic uh, genealogy. It's Robert Hine from um, Cambridge that kind of said, well, wait a minute, you know, psychologists, you have amazing points and ethologists, you have amazing points. And look, <laughs> these things go together perfectly well. If you acknowledge that behavior is not just nature or just nurture, and it's a complex combination of both. Um, and it's a little bit worrisome for me to see the, the new wave of behaviorism, especially in the US, but it, it, it spreads, not in academia, because it's not really a thing since probably the, the 80s or 90s. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly in the dog training or animal training world. Um, and I see more and more of it, uh, you know, like theories that were very popular 10 years ago, for instance, that now are being criticized, um, you know, from, I would say, a behaviorist perspective. Well, for instance, the, the work by Panksepp or some of the people mo more from the neuroscience perspective, because it's biological now, it's it's been vilified, and it feels like we're going back in time, like, you know, like some of the stuff that was going on in the 60s and 70s, and that's very, very strange to me. And I don't know where that appeal of the radical behaviorism comes from. I, I have nothing against behaviorism if it's what we call operational behaviorism, which means that it's a behaviorism that's open to talking about emotions, for instance, and the Correct. brain and, Correct. Uh, you know, cognitive processes. But the radical behaviorism that that really, uh, you know, wants to avoid any of those concepts is 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 more popular than I think it should be right now. I just don't get uh, it. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. As, I mean, I I travel even with COVID, I travel quite a bit. Somehow I find ways and I teach and I have a school and um, it, it's what, what you're saying is spot on, like the, for whatever reason, somehow that type of radical behaviorism has stuck very, very strongly in, in the dog training world. And, and it, it almost doesn't even matter. Well, we know there is so many different ideologies and camps if you want to call them this way but it really doesn't even matter uh, one will pick up one side and another extreme and so on but ultimately they all somehow s go back to to radical behaviorism and and after again just as you said so many years we 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 know better right now i mean we have evidence and we we and it it's so much more interesting actually well, yeah, and it, it, you know, I, I think one of the reasons is that if you really focus just on conditioning to explain, well, actually, that's the thing. It, I think it's the the pragmatic or the practical appeal of conditioning that that makes people say, okay, that's all I need, right? And it's true if you're a dog trainer, uh, and a lot of the work we do in my lab here. The, the, the main tools in the toolbox are obviously from basic conditioning principles to train our animals to do what we want them to do. The problem becomes when you claim that that's all you need Correct. to explain animal behavior. And, and that's where the academic world has gone way beyond that kind of thinking. Um, and for me, since we were talking about my background earlier, I spent some years studying wolves, for instance, and uh, but before that, I had worked with rats in some kind of neuropharmacology kind of stuff. I had worked with pigeons and in, in uh, spatial learning, and uh, I was kind of a behaviorist. Maybe not radical, but at least uh, operational or uh, you know more more relaxed type of behaviorist. And I remember the very first day that I spent watching, uh, observing some of the wolves I was going to work with for almost 10 years at that point. I just said at one point, wow, this is all limbic. And what I meant by this is that when I was watching them interacting with each other, there was not much 
that conditioning and a pure radical behaviorist perspective could have explained. Um, it was raw emotions. The limbic system was almost behind everything that I was seeing. There was not much even cortical in, the, in, the, in terms of, let's say, social cognition, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that they're brainless animals. On the contrary, I think they're really smart animals, no doubt about it. They have very uh, great both instrumental and social intelligence. But you know, if you reduce yourself to basic conditioning principles to explain animal behavior of any species, you're missing a lot, a lot. Right. And you, man, there's so, so many interesting topics. Hopefully we, we can touch everywhere because I really would love to. Um, you, you're based in Canada and, and that's kind of probably where the, are you born in Canada or, uh, yeah. So that's probably, I mean, it's easy to, well, not easy, but you have a, an easier access to, to study wolves and, and to, uh, uh, probably yeah it's uh, it's yeah it's true in a sense yeah because it's part of the culture in in a sense too i mean they are in most well well actually i was going to say in most provinces not not really but they are in a no actually they are in most provinces uh interestingly i'm actually in a in a in a province where there, there are no wolves uh, in fact the maritimes new brunswick nova scotia and uh Prince Edward Island, there are no wolves. In fact, they're not even in uh, Newfoundland, I believe. Um, but otherwise, you're right. Uh, you know, it's the wolf is an animal that is part of our, yeah, is part of our culture. Uh, it used to be the case in the US as well, uh, especially um, the Western part of the US, actually at one point, almost everywhere on the continent, but uh, uh, certainly it is still part of the, uh, uh, the culture of some of the northern states like Minnesota, Michigan. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, it, it's it's a little bit different here for the access. As I say this, there's probably more wolf researchers in the U.S. than Canada overall. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably a question of obviously our right population. We're a tenth of your population in the U.S. So that, that probably explains part of it. But I don't know. Um, in fact, a lot of the wolf researchers that are Americans come here to study wolves, right? right. Like uh, David Meech uh, studied wolves uh, on Ellis Muir Island here in Canada. So I really tried to have him at some point on the podcast and he agreed. But then um, I guess just the, the, the agency he's working for still, it, it's not, I, I guess he, he's not allowed to yet. So. But I, yeah, there was something, something to do with with his job that it was not, no, not 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 allowed to. Um, do you ever think of going back to wolves? I mean, any? I know it's a completely different lifestyle, and, and it's just not a. Yeah, uh, no, actually, I'll tell you there are two reasons. You're right. Uh, the practicalities of it, especially since I have kids. Uh, you know, this is like months and months uh, away. It's very demanding in terms of the, the field work, the time. And uh, um, yeah, no, not really. The other factor I have to say is that when I stopped, I was actually relieved because um, as much as I like wolves, uh, they're not necessarily my most favorite canids. I, I worked also with foxes and, and coyotes, and I absolutely love coyotes, actually. I think coyotes are fascinating. But the problem with wolves was kind of some kind of aversive conditioning <laughs> in the sense that uh, the humans that work with wolves are really difficult to deal with. Um, there's a lot of big egos and I think it's in part, there's two things there. I think there is the the fact that it's a um, limited resource. You know, it's like you pointed out, it's it's hard to get funding. It's hard to get access to them. Um, there's a lot of competition. So there's that aspect of it. Um, and the other one is, I think it's what I call a high profile species. I was a, at a conference as a graduate student in 1996 and we, uh, we ended up being a group of people that we were all complaining uh, as students about the politics of, of research. 
And we noticed that we had one thing in common, all of us at that table, is that we were all studying high profile species. So primates, uh, cetaceans like whales or dolphins, mm -hmm. wolves, right? And I think there's something to that, unfortunately. Those species are, are kind of magnets for, um, you know, people that are there for the wrong reasons, basically. Yeah. Um, more for the attention of the species they're studying and not really for the passion of it. And I remember when I ended the wolf research, I remember thinking, I'll just go study chipmunks uh, because I think chipmunk people are nice to each other, right? I mean, nobody competes for chipmunks. Everybody's happy to work with chipmunks. And <laughs> why, why does that remind me of dog training communities? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, there's that too. <laughs> so, so then, uh, what what is wh wh where are you right now in terms of what is super interesting? What what are you into right now? Yeah. So, um, in 2007, we we had the Wolf uh, Research Center here uh, attached to the Alaska University that facilitated a lot of the the Wolf research. And there were some great people that uh, worked here, like Fred Arrington, John Fentress, uh, Peter McLeod. Um, but it, the, the center closed. A lot of those people retired. Um, so I had to reinvent myself a little bit. So I worked a little bit on coyotes for a while. Uh, but then I started actually uh, developing a research program with wildlife conservation canines. And um, basically, this is kind of what we've been doing in the last, uh, let's say, 12 years, almost 15 years uh, at some level. And it's to study applied areas of dog olfaction. Uh, the two main ones that we've done over the years are biomedical applications, mostly uh, for detection of hypoglycemia in children. More recently with Laura, Laura Kiroja, my uh, graduate student, uh, currently uh, anxiety and stress detection in people with PTSD. Um, and again, the wildlife conservation canine stuff where we've done all kinds of projects actually, uh, um, training the dogs to look for ribbon snakes um, uh, that are endangered here in Nova Scotia, uh, wood turtles, um, bat and bird fatalities at windmills. Um, we're getting into new projects now on detecting next nest and eggs of some uh, uh, ground nesters, uh, birds. Uh, also looking for owl pellets to uh, look at a project to see how much um, uh, owls get uh, contaminated by lead. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So what kind of what, what what kind of dogs do you uh how how is the selection and where what what how how do you get there yeah so the way the way it works here is that we uh we work with volunteers from the community so we don't have a kennel uh it's people that volunteer the dogs to work with us um and some of the the projects that are within those areas that I mentioned are methodological things. Like we've looked at different things over the years, like um, uh, different training methods, for instance. Uh, now we're getting into uh, dogs that are assigned trackers over over goal trackers, for instance, in training, and how that may be relevant to uh, some of the the skills, especially for biomedical alert. Uh, but we basically get whatever people volunteer. So for a while, uh, I would say 90 to 95% of the dogs we were getting were uh, border collies <laughs> mm -hmm. because Interesting. border collie uh, owners are desperate to find a job for to their do dogs. Something. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we, we went with it because... I mean, border collies are weird. Uh, they're, it's a bit all or none with them. Uh, they're either a bit too uh, ADHD 
they don't really focus or they require a lot of work or there's some kind of neurotic behavior being in the way, some kind of OCD-like behavior. By the way, I don't typically like using these labels for dogs, but I think... No, no, that, I, I totally understand what you... Yeah, absolutely. But when you get a Border Collie to, uh, first of all, understand that they have a nose, because a lot of them learn to use their nose here, uh, even the owners will say, I don't know what you did to my dog, but he sniffs everything now. Um, when they get the idea that they have, a, they have a nose, what's remarkable with them is their work ethics. Again, another term that's very vague, but I think we all understand what, what it means. Um, the only issue sometimes is uh, they may, some of them may get bored with time, the repetitiveness of what we do in the lab. But again, a lot of them will just go like, yeah, no, I mean, this is my job. This is what I do. And I will do it perfectly for as long as you want me to do it. So for many, many years, we were mostly a border collie lab. It's only in the last five years with my new graduate student that we kind of uh, opened up to other breeds with some interesting successes. Uh, uh, so yeah, we're a little bit less uh, focused on border collies, but I would say it's still about 70, 75% of the dogs we get here. But it's still probably interesting to work with other breeds just to, to experience the, the difference and what, what takes you, right? Yes, and, and you know, I, I had a border collie at the time when we started, uh, so I was a little bit biased towards that breed anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, I got a... Um, uh, a red uh, uh, golden retriever. So this is not your regular, um, you know, uh, teddy bear, uh, fluffy uh, uh, couch potato golden retriever. These are uh, very slim, very slender, a uh, very active uh, uh, working breed. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the one I have uh, is much more intense than any border collie I've ever had. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and they have a magnificent nose. This is why I realized when I got IV six years ago, yeah, okay, there th there are some noses that are better than others, no doubt about it. And they're definitely also one of the breeds that it's so highly in tune into working with the human that it. It's, it's a, they love they love to please right they'll do anything to please you so it's it's almost annoying sometimes how much they they, they love people I, uh, <laughs> I i i remember working at in the early 90s at guide dogs for the blind in in california and at the time i don't know what they have now but at the time we did have labs goldens and sh some shepherds we were starting to get away from shepherds just because they were they were excellent to work with, but the the people that were coming to get dogs, they were just not physically capable to to go with that pace. So all the like uh, some of my favorite dogs that I worked with were goldens, and some of the most ridiculous memories that I have are still with goldens because I would work a dog. And granted, it's kind of in the middle of the training and it's serious work, of course. We're right about to approach the curb. The dog has to pay attention. And next thing you know, there is somebody just around the person that walks by. They have to greet him. And with with a full blast wiggle and bow, and like just, just check out like in an instant to where he makes you laugh so much. So yeah, it's very, I mean, they're cool dogs. Um, t tell me, I'm interested in how, what, what do you, how do you, what do they get paid? Like when with the detection work, how, what is the reward normally? How? Um... So in the, in the lab conditions that, that, that we have, because a lot of the work we do here is, is not uh, actually, uh, including for the biomedical stuff is not really, um, it, it's not with the people being around. So it's with samples of breath, for instance. We just want to demonstrate that from breath, they can detect just by scent different states, wow. um, either in hypoglycemia or stress. Wow. Um, so they, they basically sniff vials that are in uh, special containers. 
and uh, we um, we 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 use the clicker. Um, um, I don't know why some people start saying that I was against the clicker. I was never against the clicker. Uh, I, it, I think it's a great, great way to uh, uh, train dogs. Um, and uh, we, as a primary reinforcer, we use uh, um, special treats. Actually, it's a mixed bag, literally, of different uh, uh, okay. value of treats, you know, from regular kibbles to, um, uh, to more exciting ones. Uh, just aligning here with the Reskola and Wagner model, you know, that the, how surprising the unconditioned stimulus is, is actually a good idea. So uh, yeah, the reinforcer basically is, uh, we have a secondary and primary reinforcer and mm -hmm. that's how we've been training. As I say that, uh, we have, we assess all of our dogs initially to see what they respond to the best. So over the years, we've had a few dogs that don't tolerate the clicker for some reason. So they, we, we used only primary reinforcers. We have a few dogs also that respond very well to play uh, better actually than food as a reinforcer. And uh, with those dogs, play was used. Um, but as you know, play as a reinforcer can be a little bit problematic if you don't have a very good discipline, you know, in making the play bout very short. <laughs> Uh, especially some of those breeds like uh, those red uh, uh, golden retrievers that will, you know, they, they get into play and then you can't snap, snap, snap them out of it uh, that easily. Um, but we, we have the policy in my lab to adjust to the dog, not force the dog to adjust to our ways of doing things. Which is so typical for, for majority of trainers. It's like we we learn a way or we get excited about a way and and we almost forget that to pay attention to the dog and see maybe that's not the best way for that one dog <laughs> yeah and it's it's also a little bit difficult honestly uh you know when we started working on this kind of stuff 15 years ago publishing some of our research was difficult because we would uh as you're supposed to do, we would acknowledge that, you know, this dog was trained this way and this dog trained this way and this dog trained this way. If you send this to psychology journals, uh, you know, that read mostly about pigeons and rats being trained always exactly the same way, yeah. usually by computers uh, on top of it, it doesn't go well. Uh, back then, at least, they, there was a lot of pushback, like, no, 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 you have to train the dogs all the same way. Otherwise, you're comparing oranges and apples. And I would say, well, not necessarily. They were trained to a criterion. That's all what matters. How we got there is, in the applied world of training, at least, kind of a, a detail. <laughs> Correct, which, which kind of goes to, to what you're teaching right now, learning and motivation, you know, like if that's the motivation that really, if that's what motivates you, it will be, ah, it will be almost a shame to, to push it away and try to motivate it with other means. And so very interesting. You know, we, uh, I, I actually, what I fight against often are students that are, you know, are coming from the, you know, very, uh, very formal research methods kind of perspective. I used to teach that course here, actually. So I understand exactly how they think about these things. But I'm the one that I have to remind them, yes, but this dog is not responding to this right now really well. And we're losing him. So what are we going to do? Are we going to continue to try to shove down their throat this kind of method that they clearly don't handle well? Or are we going to try to see what gets that dog uh, to tick, right? To, 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 to react right. properly to, right. to uh, and, and usually the common sense gets them to say, sure, we'll adapt to the dog. But it, it's funny how the, the go-to thing is, well, this is how we do things, you know, and then we, they, they want to apply that method to all dogs all the time. And it would be beautiful if it was working, but it often doesn't. Yeah, in my opinion, motivation trumps everything. Um, like when when I teach and I go, and I I also have a I have a school for dog trainers. I just started like about two years ago. It's an online school, and then um, they come for certification, and we do some hands on and do this kind of Zoom calls. Um, <coughs> and one of the big things that I 
really, really in insist and keep repeating uh, is that motivation is priority. Finding motivation, maintaining motivation, that it's a it's a healthy motivation because you, you can have a you know you can have some dogs can go way crazy to where they cannot really function and then it becomes counterproductive but getting like, like in my opinion most dog training even even today revolves around how we're gonna accomplish a behavior how we're gonna mark certain things and when we're gonna reward, but not taking under consideration that all this mechanical work, dogs really look at us like, hey, you, are you alive? Do you like what you're doing? Are we gonna actually do something together or are you really treating me like a little machine that I'm gonna sit and down and come? Um, and, and so my, my point always is that teaching behaviors to a dog, at least today, it's it's a fairly simple thing unless we are talking, you know, there is always some complex and some challenging behaviors to teach and to, to create some real ability and so on. But bottom line, it always comes down to how bad do you want to do it? And why do you want to do it? Is it because you're afraid to do it? Uh, afraid not to do it? Or is it because yeah, there's so many nuances of motivation, correct? But it really comes down to, because if, if there is motivation and if the trainer understands the, how, how crucial it is, you may not be the best trainer, but you have a dog that's willing to go on and figure it out for your lack of handling skills, just because you've tapped the right motivation of the dog, correct? Absolutely, and and, and uh, two things here I want to comment on. One, one is I think we have to um, get off this idea that there's no uh, breed differences. Uh, I know this is very trendy right now, and some people are pushing this idea, but it makes no sense even from a biological perspective if you understand how artificial selection works. Um, you know, if we've managed to create different phenotypes based on morphology, so size, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it, behavior is a phenotype too. So obviously there are trends, at least within breeds that differentiate border collies, let's say from uh, St. Bernard's, no doubt about it. Um, and it drives me nuts that some people refuse to, to, to see this based on whatever kind of principle, in part actually motivated, I, I think, by uh, breed-specific legislations. But that's another problem. Mm -hmm. um, I think that acknowledging as breed differences in, in behavior and behavioral profile is, is not, that doesn't necessarily have to go with that issue. That's a completely different one. Um, so, you know, uh, when I was working with Border Collies, I remember some people uh, were talking to me about their dogs and we would have conversations about how to train them. And they would say things like, I don't know, well, you've never trained a Malino, have you? <laughs> and then I would, I would see the trap coming and thinking, oh boy, okay, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I haven't. So yeah, the, I know this is a different reality. So then we would talk about, you know, the, the quirks of Malinois, which I, I know you know quite well. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, over the years, I, I discovered that, yeah, indeed, um, obviously, there's always individual differences, even, even within breeds, and I've seen it quite often, actually, with Border Collies. Um, but there are some huge differences. Now that I'm also more open to uh, uh, hunting breeds, uh, which I wasn't initially, um, I just discovered a completely different world, especially for the wildlife conservation canine stuff, stuff that we do, uh -huh. where I, I'm starting to see now, you know, we've created all of those hunting breeds uh, for very, very specific purposes sometimes. Half of the work is done there, just in terms of the selective breeding that was done. And I never really took advantage of it. Uh, and now I see that I should have, um, you know, there are some hunting breeds that we've used that have, were complete disasters. But when you look at what they were bred to do, 
then you realize, yeah, what was I thinking? Um, so, you know, that's that's one part that the breed the breed part. The the other one is what you say about motivation resonates with me very well because I think that again, this is an effect of behaviorism. Radical behaviorism, they never wanted to talk about what we call hypothetical constructs, right? Like cognition, like uh, emotions, and motivation was one of them. The problem with this is that this has excluded all of the new modern theories on motivation and learning that are all about what we call incentive learning or incentive motivation. And it's a beautiful world because in all of those theories, and there's so many people involved in this, uh, Berridge, Panksepp, Valen, uh, Dickinson, uh, Schultz, et cetera, et cetera. What they're basically telling us is that we can motivate, uh, we can, uh, sorry, we can uh, uh, learn or teach or train motivation. We're, we're missing a huge tool in the toolbox which is this idea that motivation is something that we can actually transform. As trainers, we have the ability to actually transform and direct motivation. It's not just about the intrinsic motivations of some individuals. Mm -hmm. It's also that you can teach them to become motivated by some things. In a way, we already do it with the, the clicker. I mean, it, it's a great example of how you're basically telling them that the clicker is announcing the potential at least of a reinforcement. And that's a lot of the magic of the clicker. It taps right into the motivational system of the dogs. This has been really well demonstrated with rats, with humans, uh, even one study by Burns, I believe on uh, neuroimaging uh, is showing that indeed some of the parts of the brain that are known to facilitate learning get activated by uh, conditioned stimuli, uh, such as the clicker, for instance, or even praise for that matter works as well. Well, I, just to interrupt, we'll, I will, we'll go back to this, but since we were right on it, I, I wanna ask your position on this because I, I go back and forth and I mean, I do have an opinion. Um, condition reinforcer, is it is, like there, there is a, notion that that I, I tend to subscribe to more and and that is that it's not necessarily a, a condition reinforcer but it's like a signpost like a like a um you know it tells you what happens but it, it's a signal more than than actual having having its own properties do you understand what i'm saying I think what you're talking about is the difference between, uh, uh, let's say, the clicker as a secondary reinforcer or condition reinforcer, and the clicker as a marker. Is that possible? That that's what you're. No, no. Just just the fact that as a conditional reinforcer, does does what are the basically what are the reinforcing properties of the clicker or our is it really just the primary reinforcer and the clicker signals uh, you know just just like a sign that says there's gonna come a right turn but nothing further than like that that sign that says right turn doesn't necessarily have any reinforcing properties so that's a, a huge area of of what i was talking about these incentive theories of learning um, and, uh, you know, there's been some debates about this. Uh, uh, I've been dragged in some of those debates with dog trainers in the past. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting about this is that uh, I think what, part of the answer is it depends. Uh, it depends how you use the clicker. It depends what your goals are. And I think this is where a lot of that discussion, and it took me too many years to understand this, are, are going in the wrong directions a lot of the time, and we, mm. we talk past each other. Uh, one of the ideas, for instance, is that um, the clicker predicts uh, that a primary reinforcer is coming. 
the key word is predict. And the question is often, does it mean to predict at 100%? This is the whole idea about a one-to-one -one ratio between you know, the, the, the clicking and then delivering the kibble, right. for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's really interesting because if you look at that literature, it's not black and white at all. Not at all like a lot of people are actually saying it is. It is not. It doesn't matter if it's rats or other species. It's not at all black and white. And there are a lot of theories that are relevant to this, to this idea. Hmm. And again, it's, it goes back to, it depends what you're trying to do. Like, like ultimately for a dog trainer, it, it really, bottom line, it does make a difference. And now looking at from what kind of glasses we put on, we can probably start looking at it as, well, it is a condition enforcement, no, it's a signal, you know, but, but uh, the bottom line for a dog trainer, uh, you, you do need, it definitely, uh, um, dogs are looking for those, you know, so, oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, so, you know, part, part of that debate also is, has to do with, um, if you, if you are, um, okay with the concept in part, at least of intermittent reinforcement, which is another thing that now is vilified a lot in animal training for reasons I don't understand. And it's really interesting because a lot of the people that are against uh, are actually Skinnerians, which is fascinating because uh, much of Skinner's PhD thesis and the content of his book, The Behavioral Organisms, is actually on intermittent reinforcement. So the fact that they, they, they turn against it fascinates me, especially when you look at what intermittent reinforcement is supposed to do, what the point of, uh, of it is, which is to often increase the responding, but also a huge resistance to extinction, which by the way, is often a huge problem with uh, medical alert dogs mm -hmm. uh, that stop working or stop responding after a while. And the main solution, if not the only solution to prevent this with these dogs is to make sure that they are on intermittent reinforcement. Because a lot of the stopping of responding that occurs in these dogs is because people don't keep the contingency and it's also a very rare event. So two things going on. It doesn't happen very often that you'll have a hypoglycemic crisis or that you will have a panic attack. Um, so the behavior has a tendency to extinguish, number one. Number two, again, um, uh, when people are going through the event and the dog responds properly, they often are too busy dealing with their blood uh, right. uh, sugar uh, levels or, or their panic attack that they don't actually reinforce the dog. So obviously after a while, the dog stops responding. It's like, well, okay, I don't see the point of this. And they, they stop doing it. This is a real, very well-known problem uh, with people that have those dogs or are training those dogs, although nobody really is talking about it openly, is that you need a lot of maintenance training to keep those dogs doing their job reliably. After a while, you're guessing, you're hoping they're doing it, you're hoping they're paying attention, but it's not guaranteed. And it's interesting because you go back to the rationale of in intermittent reinforcement and boom, then you realize that the whole point of it was precisely to deal with these kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. And yet a large number of dog trainers are against it because they will say, for instance, that it frustrates the dog. Thing is, if you are implementing intermittent reinforcement and you see frustration in a dog, you're doing it the wrong way. True. That's what we teach our students that, that uh, shape pigeons uh, and do that work with, with rats in Skinner boxes. You're going too fast. That's well known. Uh, even Skinner was clear about this. If, if, you, if you change the schedule and you increase the time between you know, when you, you uh, uh, the good behavior and the, the reinforcement uh, or the ratio, uh, you have to do it very, very progressively. And what most people do, including my students, they go way too fast. Mm -hmm. uh, they go from 100% uh, to uh, 
you know, 50%. And then they wonder why the dog is frustrated. But that's because any dog would go like, what the heck is going on here? This, you know, you used to give me a kibble every time. Uh, so that would be Las Vegas Casino. Everybody breaking the machines. <laughs> Ang angry. <laughs> Um, you know what I think with this is that the, the um, like from my experience, um, there is, I, I, I do see how tr some trainers in some situations may insist on continuous schedule. And that would be very different what, what, what we are demanding. And so for example like if and and i do a lot of high level competitions so there is behaviors that are what i call high maintenance and a little bit almost requiring something above the natural response and in those i find that because it's so demanding that continuous schedule is uh, it has some uh, a special value because it kind of I made it, you know that question mark and um, but then again like when we when we do intermittent it's it's very important because it's like yeah not right now but I'm a player I don't quit so they they both have the interesting values. I, I completely agree. And, and it goes back to this idea. It depends what you're trying to do, right? Um, and and the, the, the theory behind, behind intermittent reinforcement, let's say from a, um, from a neuroscience perspective, is that now we know from the neuroscience of learning that uh, it's not really the reinforcer that's the key as it is consumed. It's the ex the expectation or the anticipation of the reinforcer that gets the learning to work. So intermittent reinforcement addresses this in part, if it's relevant to what you're trying to do, where you get the animal a little bit on its tippy toes, right? Uh, and, and you can see it actually with rats when you can, you put them on some schedules where the, the rate of responding will increase. If that's what you're trying to do, intermittent reinforcement works, works really well, especially if it's fixed, fixed, fixed ratios, I believe, yeah, is what you get the rat going like this. Um, and and your, your analogy uh, uh, may be accidental about, about uh, Las Vegas uh, and gambling is totally right, right? Because the, the people that program those gambling machines, especially the slot machines, know exactly those rules. Exactly. They don't want you to get angry. They want you to keep plugging. And at the same time, they don't, I mean, they know you're not going to have the payoff every time. They want you to have a high response rate. They know exactly when to, you know, deliver the, the reinforcer and, uh, and it gets literally people addicted. Now, I'm not a proponent of the idea that dog training is about getting a dog addicted to anything. Uh, I don't think that's the point. Um, uh, but to go back to the link between primary and secondary reinforcer, I think, you know, part of the, the idea there also, I, and I got myself in, in apparently in trouble with this, with, um, uh, with a, a known, uh, dog trainer a number of years ago at a conference. Um, I had pointed out that actually theoretically, when you do clicker training, you're basically doing pure classical conditioning initially where you just pair the, the click with the food, click, food, click, food. The dog acquires this. And, and it there is a literature on this. In fact, it's in most of the textbooks that actually, in a sense, the clicker by itself has acquired a reinforcing value. And removing, uh, not all the time, but removing occasionally, even if it's accidentally, the delivery of the primary should not affect mm -hmm. learning. If you remove it completely, eventually that will break. But uh, this idea that you must always click and always follow with, with the primary, there's actually no uh, strong data for that. If you, if you stop completely, just use the clicker on it by itself, eventually maybe, 
But I say maybe only because, you know, a lot of what we do, especially in the, the kind of uh, agility and, and more complex kind of competition stuff that you do, some of the, the stuff I do uh, in the field as well, um, you know, dogs can't care less if I'm clicking or not. Uh, they are so self-reinforced by the work that they do. Uh, you know, I sometimes I have my beautiful, fantastic liver treats in the field, and I want to, you know, we just found a turtle, I'm all excited. And uh, they look at me, it's like, I don't have the time for this. I need to go back and find another turtle. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate training. Like all, like really ultimately, what we want to accomplish is exactly what you just said. It's like you, me and my dog, we're gonna go and do the thing that you and I love doing. And all these blocks, they were just blocks. They Yes, we had to be precise as we had to do. But there is a point in time where, like, I, I, again, like I go so much and people think, oh my God, he must be so spot on with every single time that something happens, there is a reaction and there is always acknowledgement. And I, they get so surprised. That's just like, oh, you didn't, you didn't mark, you didn't release, you didn't. It's like, guys, I have worked with this dog for five years. Like I can, I mean, the, the clever hand story. I mean, you, we don't need nothing anymore. We, we are just looking at each other and I can tell him to come to me probably in 50 different ways. It's, it, there is a point where that basic language should flourish and then, and then we just get to enjoy what we like doing. If assuming again that motivation, we have tapped into the right motivation where I kind of wanted to go back there. Um, um, w one of the interesting things for me when I train and it doesn't matter if it's detection because I also go and do a lot of detection for, for military and, and around the world or, or search and rescue, whatever it is, but there will be dogs that will come that will be from different breeds, selected genetically to do a specific job. And if we as trainers put them all in that same loop and say, okay, well, that's the reward, that's the reinforcer, that's the, instead of trying to find what is genetically reinforcing to that breed, because if we, if we can figure it out, that genetic program, this is what I'm made to do. I don't know why I'm getting so hyped up about it, but that's what it takes me. And next thing you know, if we find that, the dog is like, I really like this guy. I don't know why, but he is tapping into something that nobody else touches in me, right? And, he, and um, when, when we start to look into, okay, that, let's say, okay, it's a border collie. I mean, yes, we can give it the toy. Yes, we can give it the food. But ultimately, the whole reward can go a little bit into some stalking, some backing up, some forward, some, okay, grab the ball now. To where all those instincts, all that selection gets into play. And when that happens, that's the, the most brilliant stuff. Like if, uh, and I'm sure you know, like um, um, Chaser and, and John, and unfortunately I never got to meet him, but I talked to quite a few people that knew him at the time. And every time I watch some of the videos, ultimately the way that dog responded was not necessarily, well, he liked to play. He liked to play, but also he tapped into the typical border college genetic makeup. It's like, no, that's how we're gonna play. You're gonna stalk it, you're gonna chase, you're gonna back up, you're gonna, you know? Then you have a, a different type of dog that maybe it needs to search a little bit, or maybe it's a, a one of the bully breeds that they just enjoy to hold on to something for a long time. So if we start to look into what you like and apply it in the training, it, it changes everything. 
but I I want to go back a little bit. You mentioned the the goal and sign tracking and and something with the detection. And I know the like like just just give me a little bit more there because you said you you doing a little bit more into sign tracking or uh, I, I don't know if I, I missed it a little bit. Yeah. So first of all, a lot of what you talked about there, I think for me is this idea that, you know, you can teach motivation. I, I think the idea is to develop intrinsic motivation in dogs. That That's the, you know, a very important thing. And I think that's what we do as trainers in a way is we we get them to like what they're doing and sometimes they will do it for free if they really get into it. And that's the beauty of it. Like you said, it's, uh, and a lot of the time you're right about that too. It's to bring to them more natural behaviors. You know, um, one thing we've noticed in my lab here is that we do, uh, we do medical detection with, you know, uh, um, kind of a sterile lab, you know, a floor that's washed every day with, you know, like glass vials and stainless steel containers and that kind of stuff. And it's really boring for dogs. And a lot of the time we see their performance with time go down, especially dogs that have had experience in the field. And then uh, what we'll often do is we'll start burying those samples into uh, a, a container that has uh, wood, um, wood pellets for wood stoves. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly the behavior comes back and it's counterintuitive because, and the performance goes back too. And it's counterintuitive because it's a more contaminated environment. But the thing is they can root, they can dig, yeah. you know, it's that, and they bring all those. It's that prediction error that the brain makes. And it's like, whoops, let me pay attention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and you activate the whole brain. It becomes a fully uh, motor kind of behavior and, and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, the idea is, again, you engage more parts of the brain and that that facilitates everything. So we've noticed that a long time ago that that performance goes up. But again, uh, publishing those papers is really hard in the biomedical stuff because they will say, well, we have contamination, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, going back to the sign tracking. Um, so some of the conversations I was having with, with some colleagues about, for instance, the uh, efficacy of the... Uh, uh, the clicker, for instance, on its own, uh, or occasionally on its own, I should say, not not that I'm uh, saying that it should always keep its uh, its strength on its own after being paired, but um, we we realized after a while that it was a huge literature in rats uh, about sign trackers versus goal trackers, and this is the idea that every rat out there falls into one of three categories, actually. Sign trackers, goal trackers, and the ones somewhere in between. And the idea actually, interestingly, is that sign trackers, their sign tracking rats, are much more likely to pay attention to condition stimuli that are around them in the environment. They're also the ones that get a, like it's a, a genetic trait for addiction, correct? Exactly. And and that's where that literature is going now with the theories by Berridge, for instance. I'm a big fan of Berridge, uh, as some, uh, some people know. Um, but there's others too, Tommy, uh, with humans, etc. It's demonstrated in humans, actually, that it's a big predictor, actually, of addiction. Mm-hmm. So people that are sign trackers, the theory says, are more likely to become addicted uh, and for longer as well. So I think there are some breed differences there as well. I think, for instance, that border collies are extreme sign trackers. I would actually, uh, I would guess that Malinois are as well. Um, and I think this is one of the factors in all of this is that I think a lot of the conversations I'm having with some people uh, where there's a disagreement um, on, for instance, the use of the condition reinforcers actually come partially from their experience with their own breed. Uh, and I have no problem seeing that some breeds would be much more goal tracking than sign tracking, for instance. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so that's one of the things that we're doing in the, the, the next year actually is explore this at the individual and breed level as well. Wow, that will be so interesting. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, and it would make sense. It would uh, it it would actually uh, 
be a full convergence with both the human and the rat literature on this, actually. It, it seems to me that it just makes sense. Uh, you know, and a lot of the old stuff of Aaron's and Shoemaker that showed that some breeds like Boricaldi's, for instance, and I believe Malin was uh, as well, are uh, higher in dopamine levels in terms of basal activity uh, of the dopaminergic system, would go actually towards this idea that these would have to be sign trackers based on the neuroscience that we know um, about dopaminergic activity and, and sign tracking. Um, so it's an intriguing idea, but I think it's one that makes a lot of sense at the end of the day that uh, uh, we, we, we are thinking basically is where I'm going with this of assessing our dogs here now, not just for their nose, their trainability, uh, their motivation, but also trying to determine if they're sign trackers or goal trackers. Oh, for sure. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I mean, if, if, if you actually understand that there are two different ways to look at things and and find out which one changing everything right <laughs> and and what about the the duration of sessions what is an average session for uh not a like a seasoned dog like a normal just a, a session how long would it normally go for yeah so we we don't we don't really push it here at, at uh, I mean, um, so we will have a dog come uh, two or three times a week uh, to the lab. No more than that. We've noticed that sometimes even for some dogs, three times a week is is pushing it a little bit. Um, I think it goes towards the, the repetitiveness of the, yeah. the lab tasks, at least they have to do here. Um, now, as I say that, some dogs could probably come every day and it would be fine. But anyway, uh, so on average, it's two to three times. And the sessions during um, during a day uh, are typically three, about two to three, sometimes four sessions in a period of about two hours. And wow. each session has 10 trials. So it's not a lot. Um, but you know, uh, a dog will come here for typically two hours, and depending on how well they're doing that day, how motivated they are, they will do between yeah two and four sessions. Usually, on average, I think three. And like I said, it's only ten trials, so they take about ten minutes each. Mm -hmm. So they spend actually more time socializing with the people in the lab and having a nap under the table or having a little walk around campus than they actually do working. Um, which again, uh, you know, especially since these are not competition dogs, they're, they're pets, right. Uh, is what has been optimal for us so far. Now, again, we've had some border colleagues here that the whole time that the students are actually, you know, uh, having a tea or something between sessions, they're at the door of the experimental room, just Can waiting. Come looking. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go back to work. Obviously, we have those dogs, but uh, yeah. So we don't we don't push it. We're not in a rush, and we certainly don't want to lose our dogs. I mean, we we've seen this unfortunately more often, especially with the lab stuff, not the field stuff. The field stuff, you typically you can't stop right. them, but with the lab stuff, I would say about half of our dogs with time uh, will eventually kind of let you know, you know what, I've been doing this for a year or two now, it's kind of boring, it's always the same thing. So then we we will get them into a different experiment. So it's a different setup, or it's a different way of doing things, or it's a different order. Um, or sometimes they are excused. Right, right, right. You know, of course, I mean, boredom and habituation, this is a, you know, the repetitiveness of doing things, it's, it's, for us and dogs and rats and everybody probably um to some extent uh, i mean um yeah keeping keeping that type of motivation that it's uh i think we don't have enough at least i don't know of enough of um research done on on specifically maintaining like like just preventing boredom it's it's with everything we do. Like this is probably the the even even when you have talent for something, 
you you still have a um, depending how things are presented and how things move forward you can hit that point of okay i'm i'm just done with this we, we've had dogs that we gave a break a break to for a year for instance and that sometimes work uh you know I, it, it is funny because when they come back after a year of taking a break we call it a sabbatical uh they uh they often show up at the 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 lab uh uh, at the door, like super excited. Oh, I haven't seen you for a year. This is amazing. And and sometimes we we can get them back for uh, another year of you know being part of a few experiments. Um, but yeah, it, that's the unpredictable part of all of this. And this is why, unfortunately, um, I'm moving away now from the bi biomedical stuff. Uh, Laura actually will be my last student on biomedical projects because. What's happening now, unfortunately, for a lot of the diagnostic or alert work, the electronic nose companies are catching up on the dogs. Really? And their point is that, and they're right about this, is you don't have to worry about motivation with a machine. Mm -hmm. They'll do their work, push the button, and they'll do it. Uh, I mean, they can fail the same way that dogs will fail as well occasionally, but... Um, I don't give to the biomedical stuff a lot of life, uh, maybe another decade. 10 years from now, I think that electronic noses will do uh, the COVID detection in airports, for instance, um, will detect um, um, uh, blood glucose levels from breath uh, easily, uh, will detect anxiety also probably or uh, impending panic attacks from from breath and stuff like that. I think we're probably just about max uh, a decade uh, away from this. Um, so that's why I'm going back to the wildlife conservation stuff. I'm an ethologist at heart. Anyway, I, I work with all those other species, birds, reptiles, etc. So for me, the the dog is a research assistant uh in the field and again i've never seen a dog losing motivation in the field it's a very lab specific kind of thing that happens you know because the lab is so predictable right uh, so when saying this is silly boring but yeah it's predictable it's always the same thing you make me sniff those those vials that i've sniffed a hundred times you know it's it's always the same order for the last three months do you do you ever go do you ever get the dogs in the lab, but actually don't do detection, but just just have some other activities to where they they're like, well, this is. Yeah, I know where you're going with this. Yeah, we we, we uh, yes, we. Well, it's not very practical to do, but we we've done it right. with some dogs. Right. Uh, it, sometimes it takes time away from other dogs to to come in to do work, but we try at least to make the experience of coming to the lab interesting. But you know what? This is dangerous because we 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 decided with some of the dogs that were losing a little bit of motivation that maybe we would have playtime with them at some time, right? But then what happens is the the play time that we had overshadowed the work, and it was even harder to get them into the experimental room, even if we had associated the associate the uh, experimental room with play. In fact, that was even worse. Uh, because they were like, oh, we're here to play. No, 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 we're here to work. Now, again, with some dogs, work is play, so there's no problem. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. that 15% or 20% that sometime realize that, you know what, no, this is, this is really work. And we never push the dogs. I mean, from an ethics point of view, you know, when we have a dog that loses motivation, we tell the owners and we say, you know what, maybe it's time for a break or... Yeah. You yep. know, your dog is not enjoying this anymore, so there's no point we stop. So we never force, force the dogs to it. But we'll always try a few things. Um, but we've realized that often it backfires to try to make things, you know, to associate the lab with, with really more fun. Mm -hmm. Like just a little bit too higher of arousal and, and, and cannot really get into 
Yeah. So we have to be very careful with that. It, it has worked with some dogs, but with others, it made it much worse where they would, uh, they would say, sure, let's play. That's a great play stuff. I see my friends once or twice a week and we play, but uh, yeah, they, they, they would not even walk into the experimental room. And it probably also will depend on the level of just understanding as, as we, we mentioned very briefly in the beginning of the conversation of, of it's not just play doesn't just mean let's just go crazy there's still got to be some rules there's still got to be some uh goals and objectives and boundaries and and i think that will play a role and also if um like we we have it's a i mean it's a you know problem with competition dogs as well once you you start from a little puppy and you just keep working on something that is still the same um and what at least i i do a lot of times is i always keep in mind that boredom will be an enemy eventually it will become a problem and i would go sometimes to places and the dog is just like with your dogs coming to the lab uh, my dog going to a like a stadium the moment they see the stadium it's like okay this is showtime and i would go some quite actually more often i would go places to a you know and and other trainers will be like oh let's watch him how he trains pick up on some things right and but i don't train i just kind of ask maybe one or two things from my dog and then we just go into uh just having fun for the next 10 minutes and walk away and the, the trainers, strangely, they're like, oh, he just didn't want to show us how he trains. Not understanding that all I'm doing is making sure that my dog goes every time with that excitement of, we, this is going to be a cool thing. It's not a chore. It's not a, yes, there will be, whenever there is an element, whenever we say, okay, let's interrupt the play and let's do something. Yes, there is some compliance. There is some obligation, but... I want you to want it. Otherwise, there is no point. Who cares if you can do it, but you're pushed into it? That's not the point of dog training. Yeah, oh. and and you know, with the dogs that we were talking about at the beginning, that that are not uh, you know sensitive to food as a reinforcer and work better for play. Uh, when we do that between trials, we that has to be very disciplined. So, for instance, uh, we have a dog. Uh, you know, gets the click, that was good response. Then we have the ball, we throw the ball once, brings the ball, it goes back into the, the bag. And now it's time for the next trial. Yeah. The students have a really hard time keeping that, that, uh, that discipline because you, you basically have to train the dog to understand that play bout is going to be 10 seconds at most. And, you know, it's one throw of the ball or the Kong and that's it. And then you go back to work if you want to continue. Um, and that's easier said than done. I have to say play. And I think Ken Ramirez said that before, uh, at least I was told, play can be problematic that way. To, you know, to get a dog to, to get off the, 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 play, the play mode, you really have to be clear that, you know, there's a temporal boundary to this. Mm -hmm. You know, that play bout is going to be 10 seconds, then we're back to work. And, um, uh, but so far with the dogs that respond to play, most of them we've managed to train to understand that, you know, the, the play bout is short. If you want to play more, go to the next trial and, you know, give it go the right response right. and you'll be all good. So with play, like my... I, I'm probably one of the biggest proponents on, on play as a motivation. Um, like I can never say never, but I really do not use food as a reinforcer. My, my, all, all of my training is play-based. Um, and I divide it on, like we have play as an activity and these are just terms that I use for for my own people when I teach uh, when we have play as an activity but we have play as a game which means it's a it's a structured there is an objective like 
like just like when you play basketball there you have to have the hoops you have to have the and you don't just grab the ball and run there is rules there is penalties there's this it's a very structured game and if i teach the dog assuming again how we were talking about genetic predispositions what what do you like and i in if i can inject some of those genetic uh, um, instincts or 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 whatever we want to call it into the game but we still have an objective we have rules we have uh penalties for breaking rules but it's a it's a very structured game and i can show the dog that they're really good at that game but not so good to where they feel that they are so superior that there is no challenge anymore there is no competition anymore there is nothing that you know but the game is always th- this is the interesting part right any t- any game that we want to go and watch it's always we don't know exactly and uh, that's where i like in a very early age with really with ev- every dog that i do i i'm not preoccupied with teaching a sit and down and you know kind of all the classical luring things and and but i just go into play and teaching a game because i find that if i teach the dog a game before they even know sit we in that struggle for me to explain what the game is about and that they're good but not so superior when that happens i actually have so much going on from that point as far as like i've accomplished a different level of cooperation like i mean you 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 know like you can we can look at just wolves or any, any dogs you know you can have the strong dog the weak little dog but if both want to play the bigger dog will never just slam him to the ground and get the stick and go away because then that's the end of the game he has to level up and make the game interesting and i spend that that's kind of it, it always been my go to um way of maintaining motivation and 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 then talking about behavior problems talking about all, all sorts of things you know like if if that dog understands how to play a certain game and he knows the rules and he knows that he's good at it i always give these analogies of uh, um you know like you can have a little kid from from europe that plays soccer and we can throw him in brazil all by himself in the soccer field and within 5 minutes he's accepted and they are doing something together and and you can totally manipulate control and self confidence through play which you cannot really do um i mean you could but it's almost very artificial if you try to do it in a different way i mean that's kind of what games are about it's all about if you're good your self confidence is if if you can outsmart then you have strategies then you have to understand that you have to restrict yourself from breaking rules and so on there's just so much more i don't even know how i went there right now and why i went there but um i i really don't know what I was talking about <laughs> the so the 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 pancep or or actually barrage theory about about using play also would suggest that play is indeed a very potentially very strong reinforcer um because it produces uh gets you to produce endorphins the same way that food would for instance but again the key is to get the animal back in anticipation this is why when you say there are rules Uh, for us is the stopping rule basically is that okay that play bout is done uh but i mean you have to realize too that the stuff we do in the in the lab when we do a session of let's say 10 trials for a scent detection uh it it's 
pretty quick, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't have a lot of time to uh, playing. Uh, it distracts the dog too. And uh, so in the field, I'm much more likely to use play. Um, there's more degree of freedom. There's more space. There's et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, going back to the motivation part of things, play is very powerful for dogs to respond to it as a reinforcer. There's no doubt about it. And another thing that we've noticed over the years is based on the reaction of the students often when a dog uh, suddenly has a decrease in performance. Uh, and this is something that happens in the lab. The first, uh, the first instinct of the students is to go back. Uh, so it, they, they, they go right away into the baby step kind of thinking, and if it's too hard, just make it easier, and then the dog will come back. Mm -hmm. It almost never works. What usually works is what I tell them to do, which is, no, make the task harder. And usually it's amazing, and the students never believe it until they see it. That's when the performance comes back. That goes towards that boredom comment that you made earlier. I think a lot of the time we underestimate our dogs and we we get them to do things that, you know, they're ready to go further. Yeah. Uh, it it works a lot with send detection for, for us. Uh, I usually tell the student, yeah, this is this is too easy. Uh and and the the game is over then, right? If it's mm -hmm. You, you always write and you know that you'll have this 90, 95, 100% of the time. Okay, you get the kibble, but but there's that other dimension of the task that is completely gone. And so we then we dilute the odor or we, we, we do something to make the task harder and then suddenly the performance goes back up. And you also see that the dog is more engaged. The tail's going a little bit more, the sniffing becomes even more, you know, and there you go. Yes. And it's not so much, it's not so, it doesn't necessarily even need to be harder task as long as we trick the brain to where it's like, oh, this is not what I yeah. know. You, you change, well, yeah, exactly, changing the game. And again, th this for a, a researcher is a nightmare because if you try to write a paper where you say we had to do this with this dog and, you know, and then they will be all over you on this. We do it anyway, but um but yeah, wow. no, absolutely. It, it's the understanding, I think, that, you know, uh, if you go back to the Ruskell and Wagner model, actually, it's a, right. it's indeed this idea that, uh, and, and as we know, actually, it goes beyond Ruskell and Wagner. It's not just the, the, the US, it's also the CS that's important in all of this, like Pearson Hall and all of the others, Macintosh as well. Uh, a lot of these great models that were developed in the uh, 70s and 80s basically showed that the worst thing you can do is make things way too predictable. Yes, right? yes. So we, we go back to what I was saying about, do you need to always pair the CS with the US? A lot of people actually uh, throw at me Ruskell and Wagner uh, to make their point. And I always find that funny because if you actually look carefully at what happened after Ruskell and Wagner, first of all, Ruskell himself, um, admitted that his model was not very predictive of everything in classical conditioning. It had some flaws. Changes theory actually, uh, or you know, uh, helped to uh, uh, identify some of the issues with it. And then, as Wagner of Reskel and Wagner, that developed his whole model. Uh, and uh, my favorite is probably Pearson All that developed a model that actually showed that, interestingly. Um, that predictiveness is precisely the problem. And they have this great experiment, I think it's Kay and Pierce actually, um, showing that actually uh, uh, a 50% pairing of the CS with the US is actually working better mm -hmm. than a 100% pairing. So going back to this idea, do you always need to pair the CS with the US uh, on a one-on-one uh, ratio, actually the answer is according to that model, no. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, and it goes back to this idea that anything even in classical conditioning is going to eventually get predictable and predictable is boring. Right. It, it's basically what those models are, uh, you know, eventually uh, uh, saying. And that's kind of where the, I don't know why, why, 
I mean, you probably have noticed this too, but the, the dopamine word is big in the last few years in dog training. And a lot of times it's, I, I don't think people even understand what, how to, what it is about and how to do. And I'm almost afraid to even talk to you about it because like, you, you know, so, so you, you can put it so much better than me, but uh, I mean, it's always the search for something new. That's what really triggers dopamine. It's the moment you have it, it's done. Game is over. Like you're just like I, if I win a, a world champion tomorrow, how long it's going to last a day, a week. And, and then th there's gotta be an, a, a new, a new chase. And that's, that's what dopamine does. It's, it's, it strives on chasing the, 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 that new something that you cannot something that it's yeah and and that's these incentive uh motivation uh models i was talking about it's it's exactly what where neuroscience is at right now um i you know i'm a little bit responsible for putting that dopamine thing out there and i kind of regret mm. the way that i initially talked about it I think that comes from uh, Sparks 2014 or one of those conferences. And, um, um, you know, if, if, if I had to go back, I would introduce the concept differently. The mistake I made at the time was to try to explain this from a neuroscience perspective. And what I've been doing in the last year or two is to go back to the learning theory models that were making exactly the same point without the neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's the last three or four presentations uh, or webinars I've given actually. And the, it, those models are either forgotten or just not known. And I don't understand because there's even some young faculty that, that engage in this debate that don't seem to know about these models. Um, but anyway, they, they, are, they are quite powerful because, again, it's this idea that you can teach, you can condition motivation, which is very powerful if you yes. think about it. Wow. And it goes exactly towards what you're saying, which is basically you're not learning if you're bored and you're not learning if you're not anticipating something that's potentially exciting. Uh, doesn't matter if it's food, play or something else or even praise, right? And even, I mean, to go even further, the brain doesn't even ultimately it doesn't even make difference in in is it negative is it positive reinforcement is it's it, it has to intrigue the brain that that's really the bottom line somehow yeah it, it's you know i you have to be a little bit careful about you know like uh, if if you start using aversives and, and stuff like that but again i mean on that debate which is another one I, I think we've lost a little bit our common sense here, the way we discuss about these things in all black or white. But, um, right. but in a sense, if you do work with the anticipation of just of reward, anticipation of a reinforcer, you don't even have to think about using anything um, aversive or punishers. Um, but again, if you establish just a very, very boring and extremely predictable link between, uh, um, you know, the 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 the, uh, the, the condition reinforcer and and uh, the primary or or you know whatever how you reinforce your animal, then then yeah, then then you need to be mm -hmm. much more creative. And it's this idea that how do you engage that brain again? That's not understood. Right. And again, we go back to. We go back to intermittent reinforcement. The idea also that if you don't know that you will get reinforced, it doesn't mean that it's punishment. Um, right. If you don't get reinforced, it doesn't mean that it's punishment. It means actually for a dog that's well engaged in the task, what's next? Let's get to the next trial so I can get a chance to get reinforced. You know, people often tell me, aren't the dogs that... Uh, are not reinforced every time getting angry at you, barking, biting, that kind of stuff? No. And the ones that do, usually it's only because the student went a bit too fast. Again, going back to this idea that you can't go super extreme on this. 
and if they do, it's because they haven't developed yet what I would call this, you know, incentive motivation. Uh, they haven't developed yet this intrinsic motivation. And that's because you didn't do it right or or you went too fast. I know, I know that you like like by like like who you are is uh, from from everything that I've read and and by the way there is the, the way I I got introduced to you and then once I read this one article then I kind of went into search and and listened to a bunch of podcasts and some presentations and so on but there was um what was it the there was that one 50 shades of gray misuse of misunderstanding and misinformation of the concept of dominance and punishment and i am like there, there if there is three things that i am really about that's play um all all reinforcement and all varieties of punishment and genetics like i've been breeding malinois for since 89 and i've done so many and like pretty much any little research that came out i was able to just do it myself with my own dogs to see if like you know like the military neuro like early like all the little tests even including um back to going back to was it Pfaffenberg or who was in the saying how they did selection with the guide dogs and 50% increased the rate of success and then I ended up working there and I'm like well it's still 50% chance of succession nothing has changed regardless of, of all the tests that they the volunteers still are doing and they, these kind of things are always puzzling me and very very interesting about but what i like the um, i i know you are big on force well force free stress free fear free all all that concept right and i i really want to get a little bit to hear what your opinion is on like m what I'm thinking because we uh, just just kind of like what, how you talk in your some of your articles like oh yeah we know punishment works I mean but do we need to use it is it ethically co eth ethically and morally and, and so on um, and then we talk about negative reinforcement and I always think and I always when I use like I like for example if we play let's say we play that game of hot hands right that would be a game of negative reinforcement and there is a very cool incentive and when done properly there is not necessarily fear there's actually i mean we play it all the time as kids uh, at least back in Europe, that was a you know one game that p kids play. Even 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 with a two-year-old, you're playing such a game. And there is, we know, and for some reason we avoid talking about it. But we know that avoiding something unpleasant is more important than getting something pleasant. We know that it's fundamentally, at least in our planet if it's not the m most fundamental law biological that you avoid something unpleasant and you approach something pleasant so this is this is here it's so deeply programmed billions of years to the single cell organism correct like it, it's i don't think we need to learn it i think this is something that we know very well how to respond now, can it be done wrong? Uh, no question about that. But it's here, and it, in my opinion, it's here to stay. And it can be, it can be dangerous, or it can be highly beneficial. And I always hope that one day I can make I can 
Like I could send you videos, for example, of, of dogs that I trained that I have trained from puppies in a, a dog trained through positive reinforcement and a dog trained through negative reinforcement to a year old now knowing a bunch of commands and have super cool motivation and both dogs will be off leash off training colors of anything there will be no difference in the way they will perform or in the way they feel uh, uh, their emotional states because it's they both have the willingness to play they both have the willingness and the confidence to to succeed i i guess the point i'm trying to make is that there there is people will do that just like dogs will do that i mean dogs play with each other right when when we like at least my understanding when i look at two dogs kind of chasing and biting each other to me that is a negative reinforcement game to to a a very skillful and very it's actually a lot of fun game because just kind of like playing some martial arts in a way do you, do you can you see it like this two dogs playing as a a negative reinforcement kind of game or or uh, my, my thinking about this is that I think we, uh, in this conversation of the quadrant and, uh, you know, th this overemphasis on the positive reinforcement, uh, I, I think we, we derailed completely sometime in the 90s, maybe early 2000 about this by, right. by first of all, misinterpreting a little bit what the quadrant is saying, which is basically that in a way, any life, life is about the balance between all, all four. The contrast often between all four is often what's important. But the ethics of modern dog training is focusing on only positive reinforcement, which by the way, is not actually uh, the way that we conceptualize it as humans, necessarily uh, appetitive or positive I mean, positive in this sense here that it's seen positively by the dogs. We decided it is. Right. We don't ask the dog because, you know, the quadrant, what we forget is that it's all about the perception of the dog, of what they think is uh, um, punishment or, uh, or reinforcement. So I've seen dog trainers, um, in French, we say acharnement, that... Uh, that, that can't give up with the clicker or whatever, you know, and they persist and they persist trying uh, with positive reinforcement when actually just one, one, no. Right. Would have stopped the behavior. But there's this allergy now of uh, or, or this aversion in dog trainers to ever say no to a dog. No, you don't say no to a dog, it's punishment. Well, wait a minute, actually, is it? I mean, first of all, you could make the argument as condition inhibition. You don't actually have to go this far. Uh, it's just a way of saying you're not going to get reinforced right now. So in a sense, it can be a non-reward marker in some cases. Correct. That doesn't remove, uh, that doesn't remove the, the whole controversy around it. But you know, one of the points I was making in that article that you mentioned, 51 Shades of Grey, was to say that, well, you know, we don't have to see a discriminative stimulus or a non-reward marker as uh, as something bad. It, first of all, it's not necessarily a condition punisher, but the way that people define saying no to a dog, they define it as a condition punisher. That's not what I was talking about. Um, okay, so mm. there's a lot, lot around there here that, you know, again, it's what is aversive to a dog? That's the first question that we have to ask ourselves. You know, if we go with uh, uh, negative uh, reinforcement, it depends what is the initial state of the dog. If if the the, the state that you 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 get them out of is extremely aversive, then I'm against correct uh, negative uh, reinforcement. But uh, if it's just a question that the dog likes 
to be off the leash when they get to a certain area where it's off leash and that's seen as a reinforcement or well, great that's that's no big deal i mean you still have to walk from your house to that location anyway with the dog on leash um <laughs> what i'm saying here is that actually i think we we apply negative reinforcement and punishment daily with our dogs a lot more than we think and we drive ourselves nuts in trying to avoid it at all costs in training when we still use it more than we think we're not even aware of it yes part and part of that problem i think also is another thing i talk about a lot in terms of the psychology and the neuroscience of this concept which is resilience it's this idea that we're in a culture right now where we've accepted this strange idea that with our kids and our pets we should protect them from any form of stress of life the problem with that is that anybody in psychology and neuroscience would tell you that that's not how you train resilience resilience is not something that you will develop if you're always uh kept away from uh stress or anxiety so that means that stress immunization is something that like the immune system is developed through being challenged so i'm not saying you should use punishment to train your dogs or any kind of reversives or anything stressful i'm saying this idea that we must at all cost only give them things that they they see as positive or appetitive is actually potentially misguided. I think that a dog needs to experience the normal stress of life, not extreme, the normal stress of life. Um so that's you know that that's a lot here conceptually to think about, but I think we we are kind of in uh, the middle of a pendulum movement from you know the 80s where punishment was used quite a bit. uh yeah. shock collars and everything to this other extreme right now where no you must not at all uh, ever say no to your dog or uh, uh, or indicate that they've made the wrong a, a wrong choice or decision or whatever and i think eventually we'll come back somewhere in 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 the middle um i have a tendency to think of dog training based on the kind of relation i want to establish with my dog and I parallel this with the kind of relationship I want to develop with my kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'd rather have a good positive relationship with my kids based yeah mostly on reinforcement but I would delude myself to think I never say no to my kids. <laughs> Obviously I do. Um and you know the danger here is is how are you translating or or moving this into dog training. Um So I I'm not pro punishment it's not what I'm saying but at the same time I do not I'm not against informing a dog politely nicely of a wrong decision in other words you know in the discrimination tasks that we do here with biomedical samples when the dog gives the right response they hear the click they get the kibble or a, a short play bout but if they get it wrong they get thank you right and that's simply a way of saying you failed this trial so walk out of the room and then let's go for the next one and it takes yeah. five seconds yeah which which is what we what I, i i talk about normally when i teach uh it's understanding the progression is reinforcing and knowing how to manipulate progression of the event and if you if if you can show that that progression can stop it's super powerful yeah and, and the thing we never see a dog i mean sometimes they'll go out, oh you could see this oh i missed it that one but what they do then is they run out of the room because they can't wait to get into the next trial right mm -hmm. uh and again it takes about 5 seconds by the time the door is open again and they can go to the next trial that the the assistant just has the one of the two or three assistants just needs to have the time to to switch the the you know play with their random order of the uh 
the targets uh, in the lineup or the two AFC that we do, whatever. But that's the idea is that it's uh, it doesn't have to be uh, seen as a, a punishing event or an aversive one. It can actually contribute more to, okay, okay, you have another chance now. Let's, you, you didn't get this one, let, let, let's go and get the next one, right? You keep it positive. Um, some people say, why don't you redirect the dog towards the right answer? Well, we do this initially in the initial training. We say, oh, no, but look, that's that's the one. Look, look, look at that. Sniff. Oh, yeah. There you go. Good dog. And then we, you know, we do a, what we call an error correction. Basically, we say, OK, you got that one. But after a while, you have to stop doing this, because then if you if you if you keep doing this, they will know that any trial that they do, they will eventually have the right answer and it stop working and they don't uh, make any effort anymore. So they do have to experience the whoops, that wasn't it. No, thank you. Let's try again. But you would not believe the number of dog trainers that have told me, no, you can't do that. That's not ethical. That's mm -hmm. that's just aversive training. It's like, well, yes, it becomes very, very strange. Like it's a it's a difficult place where we are. I, I, I always hope that somehow and I don't put myself because I'm I, I I I don't even know where I belong. I I just train dogs and whatever. Whomever is in front of me, bottom line is that that dog is emotionally stable and motivated to do things with me. And when you said earlier, by the way, that I said punishment works. Let's be clear for people that did not read Fifty One Shades of Grey. What what I was saying is, it works but potentially with consequences. I mean, it, right. it's right. So when people say punishment doesn't work, no, 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 it actually works. Uh, but, but there are side effects of it that you don't want if you want that stable, uh, positive relationship with your dog, right? Or with your children, <laughs> as I use that analogy sometimes. I, I don't want to be the the naggy parents that always says no and you know uh, uh, no i mean there's ways to build a constructive relationship based on positive reinforcement mostly um that will actually work um but you know it, it's it's a weird conversation because I, I often talk to dog trainers where i realize that that even we have weird perceptions of what we think punishment is i'll give you an example for instance they'll say They'll say, uh, well, when the dog gives the wrong answer, instead of saying no or no, thank you, why don't you, um, why don't you just ignore? Mm -hmm. This to me is fantastic that they don't even see that actually ignoring is often worse. Yes. The only time that I got a dog barking at me or even sometimes trying to, to snap at me was when I would not give it the information. So they seek information. They'd rather know that no, that was wrong than me just doing as if nothing happened and get them out of the room. They go like, what the heck? What's going on here? So I don't see it as punishment when you say, or a non-reward marker, even although I, I guess that word could mean that in a sense. I see it as giving feedback. You say, yes, good dog. Yay, fantastic. It was great. Or no, thank you. Thank you. No, that was not it. Let's try again. Right. And you can keep it positive. It's just a way of saying, all right, you're not getting reinforced on that trial. No big deal. Let's go to the next one right, right. away. So, but if I play devil's advocate here, emotionally speaking, the dog, and that, that kind of goes back to what you just said very, just, just a while back, uh, a lot of trainers that are, are, considering themselves force free but they fail to teach something correctly and there is a struggle and there is no physical uh, uh, punishment used but mentally and, and very visibly vis visible you see that the dog is in a bad emotional state because he uh, he or she understands that they need to do something they are trying it's not leading anywhere and now they're becoming kind of suppressed 
and experiencing very similar event on on a uh, as far as the brain is concerned like if i have uh, uh one of a kind of simple example that i talk about um i'm obviously with my accent you know i'm from eastern europe so let's say we I, we go we go back to bulgaria and we go to a gas station and i have this really funky car and i say simon i'm going to give you 5000 euros if you can fill it up in 2 minutes and now you have to find where the where the tank is right and you have completely you're super motivated to find it now i can let you struggle or i can say no that's a wrong idea you're going to the uh, spare tire there will be element of a version that will actually at least if it happens to me i will be grateful because you are helping me to get unstuck from somewhere instead of leaving me alone to figure it out does that make sense i i used a very similar analogy uh uh when i was at a conference in eriche eto dog i think it was called where i said look uh the 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 way i see it is this um you you get in a cab and uh, you're telling the taxi driver that actually doesn't know the city at all to go to the airport so tell me which one will get faster to the airport the situation where you say only yes when the taxi driver makes the right turn or the one where you say yes or no before they engage in a wrong turn uh or after the wrong turn uh i think it's clear that the one where you indicated you gave the feedback positive or negative will get to the airport faster than the one where you just give one type of feedback um and in other words yes it not giving information and that's a cognitive theory obviously is is potentially extremely extremely frustrating Right. there's another dimension to this that a lot of dog trainers don't realize is if you look at the work of uh, psychologists that work with kids so my wife works with uh with children in hospital setting also in kind of uh procedural issues where they have to go through some very difficult procedures sometimes that come with pain and those kids will uh you know kick the nurses and spit at the doctors and that kind of stuff and and uh, her job as a psychologist is to walk in and try to change that situation she points out to me that the people that work in um uh, pediatric health psychology actually know that sometimes uh persisting with positive reinforcement in those situations will take extremely long will be extremely frustrating and may not work at all and then the ethics of this is after an hour or two of trying to get the kid to accept the procedure they're still super stressed and they end up having to strap them down when actually if you had just walked into the room let them play with an ipad for 5 minutes and then say okay if you want to play more with this you will have to do the procedure and then if they don't comply you walk out with the ipad which is basically negative punishment correct but then the procedure happens ethically there's no doubt that the second scenario is better than the first you solve the problem in maybe 10 minutes instead of spending 2 hours persisting with positive reinforcement to no avail including the stress and the resistance and the back and forth So this idea that positive reinforcement reinforcement is always non-aversive is wrong. Correct. It it's not necessarily true especially not in the way that it may prolong the period of stress. And sometimes a uh yeah, a an aversive relatively aversive intervention is ethically desirable because you reduce that stress to again 5 or 10 minutes as opposed to an hour or more 
Now, That's again, right. when, when I say this, I sound like I'm pro-punishment, and I'm not. Right. I'm not. But we have to realize that there are some situations where uh, we have to think about the ethics of it. I mean, I think we always need to think of the ethics. And you know what is uh, kind of, in, in a lot of way, it's unfortunate and sad that that word is packed with so much confusion and, and immediately brings uh, uh, just, just it, it's it's not a like it's very difficult to talk about it um, when when we try to talk about punishment, especially in dog training and and with kids. Just as you said, it, this is a very very big problem, um, and somewhere it went wrong. And I don't think anybody knows exactly where it went wrong. Well, you know, part of the being wrong, look, if you if you really believe in this concept that you never say no to a dog, that means you probably believe to the idea or often anyway, you never say no to a kid. Well, look at what kind of generation we've created. We are dealing right. with that generation now that was never told no for anything. And then we complain that they're entitled. Well, where do you think that's coming from? Obviously, they are entitled and they feel entitled because we never told them no. Uh, so, I mean, it's again, life is not that simple. Life is not all rosy. It's not just white or black. Uh, it's not even black and white. It's shades of gray. And that's the whole point. Uh, it's complicated. You may want to avoid the extremes, but the idea is that, yeah, it's not just one dimensional. There's many different factors in all of this. It's not as simple as some people want it to be, unfortunately. Yes, and there is, I mean, really, ultimately, there is cost and benefit at all the time. And like like with the example you gave me with your wife and the kids, um, I think one of the big difference that we don't like to talk about between dogs and kids, it's super obvious. Like we, we can really say, hey, you're not going to get the iPad unless like we can instruct. It becomes a little bit more interesting, the approach when somebody has a little, uh, well, not a little, but some serious uh, 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 mental uh, um, disabilities, then, then the approach is not so straightforward because at that point, negative punishment not necessarily makes sense the way uh, um, you and I can make sense of. And when we bring it back to dogs, for dogs, I personally believe that they are way more easy to understand and respond to that simple biological fundamental thing of I will approach something that I like and I will avoid something that I don't. And and somehow that went wrong in the terms of dog trainers start to do stupid, mean things to dogs to where it, it just, you, you either have to call somebody and take the dogs away or you have to walk away or, or something because it's just, it's heartbreaking to to even listen to hear it what's going on but that's not like like we are just bouncing from one extreme to another hoping that there can be a, a solution and if we talk i mean if we talk about differential reinforcement ultimately Differential reinforcement, like just like if it's impossible, which actually I want to talk to you about this. I want to ask you uh, um, what punishment-based training mean, means, because I, I never get to understand when somebody says that, but I never get the chance to ask what that means. But, but let's say just because I think it's very difficult to teach new behaviors entirely, entirely through punishment. It's just, I don't see how, but it can be also very difficult to suppress 
uh, undesired old behavior in entirely through uh, reinforcement of incompatible behaviors. And if, if reinforcement of the un, un, undesired behavior cannot be completely uh, um, eliminated, then what do we do? Then, then what's gonna happen is likely it will continue to, to be there and now we will have the, the new behaviors, the differential reinforcement behaviors, and ultimately we will have a, a concurrent schedule of reinforcement with depending uh, which behavior is available. You know what I'm saying? And so in, in this situation, some form of punishment, see, I, I even hesitate to say it because it's just, it's such a, word that it's packed negatively, but to me the best formula would be to, to be able to suppress the unwanted behavior and use all the cool differential reinforcement to, to redirect. Well, you know, and so uh, I, I don't have situations where I would go there in what I do but i here's the thing the the like i said earlier i think you know a huge part of the the problem is we we've um, in french we we talk about la la démesure but we we've gotten crazy about the 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 concept of punishment as well uh which is the idea that there's mild punishments and there's not so mild punishments obviously uh yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. I guess I'm not sure I... I mean, I don't, I guess, like my, my thing is, why do we not talk about like trainers, scientists? Why do we not, why can we not have the conversation? Yeah, well, I think that it's, 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 it's in part because we're dealing also, here's the thing. I think we're dealing with, for instance, people that use shock collars. Okay. Um, This is not a method I like personally. Um, in the 80s, when I first started training, uh, I used it once and uh, I, I realized it was not at all working. And, and back then, by the way, the, the positive um, training, uh, you know, ideology didn't, didn't yeah. really, what yeah. was not around uh, at all. In fact, I learned this from military people actually. So anyway, um, but and, you know, again, I realized this is not a kind of relationship I want with my dog. So I walked away from that completely. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I was going to go with something here. I'm not sure I want to go there, which is the idea that, uh, again, a lot of people think they're not using ever punishment, but they do actually in some ways. Uh, and I was also going to make comments about the, the you know, what, what, again, what kind of quote unquote punishment you use. And is it actually punishment or is it extinction for instance right i mean there's different ways of stopping our behavior um it, it doesn't always require uh uh punishment per se there's conditioned inhibition that's you know purely classical conditioning there's anyway there's all kinds of different ways right. of approaching correct. it correct um but again i mean i think we just have to bring it back to the quality of the relationship that that we have with our dogs and i think that's uh, you know, I, I think one that is positive, and by positive, I mean, uh, you know, happy. Uh, there's no resentment. There's no, uh, you know, there, there's desire to play. There's there's affection. There is yep. uh, there is good communication. This is what we should strive for, basically. Yep. Um, and anything that's aversive to a dog, well, it will happen anyway. Even with the, you know, the all positive people. Uh, but the question is, is to try to minimize that as much as we can. Um, and yeah. yeah. Hey, listen, I kind of have to go. That's fine. We've been like, I mean, mine, we, we did like a, a marathon. Like I, I truly appreciate, like this was a, a very, very cool conversation. Simon, thank you. Like the, that was very, very cool conversation. I know like you just said it and now I realize, man, we've been talking for a long time. 
<laughs> yeah, a little bit over two hours, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's fun. I would not do it if it wasn't fun. So I do it because it's fun. It's play for me. Very nice. Thank you and have fun training tonight. Thank you.